Hi class, in this recording we're going to focus primarily on the endocrine functions of various tissue types and organs within the body, the, the miscellaneous tissues and organs of the body. We're also going to focus on senescence of the endocrine system at the very end. So first, let's focus on skin. Within our skin, we have a cell type known as the keratinocytes. This is the single most common kind of cell within our epidermis. The keratinocyte is known for taking a cholesterol-like steroid known as cholecholesterol and making that cholecholesterol from ultraviolet radiation. That cholecholesterol is then going to be sent to the liver and cholecholesterol is going to be converted into calcidiol. Calcidiol is, can be thought of as activated vitamin D. Our liver is also going to secrete a hormone known as angiotensin. And this angio, excuse me, angiotensinogen, a pro-hormone, it's one chemical reaction away from being an activated hormone. Angiotensinogen, when activated, ultimately turns into angiotensin II, which is a hormone known to regulate our blood pressure. We'll talk about this one in a lot more detail when we get to biology 314 and our cardiovascular system. Our liver is also going to secrete a little bit of erythropoietin. Most of our erythropoietin comes from our kidney, but yes, our liver does also make some of our erythropoietin, which stimulates the red bone marrow to make red blood cells. Our liver is also a source of IGF-1. IGF-1 is a hormone that is ultimately going to regulate the action of human growth hormone. Another hormone secreted by the liver is hepcidin. Hepcidin. And when we think of hepcidin, I want you to think of a hormone that helps us absorb iron. Hepcidin is a hormone that relies on vitamin C to have good activity, which is a lot of reasons why individuals that are suffering from low iron concentrations in their body are going to be prescribed iron and vitamin C supplements at the same time. Within our kidneys, our kidneys are going to take that calcidiol from the liver and convert it to calcitrol, a the single most active form of vitamin D. And that calcitrol, calcitriol, <laughs> my tongue's tied, sorry about that. That calcitriol is going to ultimately make it so that we have more calcium ion absorption in the intestinal tract and minimize the amount of calcium ion secretion, the loss of calcium ions within our kidneys as we produce our urine. Our kidneys are also responsible for secreting a hormone known as renin. Renin is going to take angiotensinogen, one of our pro-hormones, and convert it into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 2 ultimately will be created, created by angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, and we have lots of that ACE angiotensin conversing enzyme within our lungs. Angiotensin 2 will then act to constrict blood vessels, ultimately raising our blood pressure. Our kidneys also make most of, 85% of erythropoietin, which again stimulates our red bone marrow to make red blood cells or erythrocytes. Within our heart, there are the muscle of the atria, the cardiomyocytes of the atria, those chambers on the superior margin of the heart, are going to secrete a kind of hormone known as a naturetic peptide. This is going to be a hormone that it will ultimately lower our blood pressure. Natriuretic peptides ultimately lower blood pressure. The stimulus that causes to be secreted is going to be an increase in blood pressure. When we experience that increase in blood pressure, these peptides are going to decrease blood volume and decrease blood pressure by causing us to have more sodium ions and more water molecules be added into the urine by the kidney. So we'll have ultimately more sodium-rich and more diluted urine in response to natriuretic peptides, and this will lower our vo blood volume and blood pressures. Our stomach and small intestine have a lot of hormones associated with them. Um, these are collectively referred to as the enteric hormones, and when we see this term enteric, these are this is going to refer to of the digestive tract, of the digestive tract. The enteroendocrine cells, the digestive hormone cells are going to be cells that make hormones within the digestive tract. These hormones do many different things like controlling our feelings of hunger, controlling the movement of substances through our digestive tract, or regulating the secretion of digestive enzymes within our digestive tract. 
classic examples of these enteric hormones that we talk about in more detail in bio 314 include CCK, cholocytokinin, gastrin, ghrelin, and peptide YY, PYY. As we look at adipose, adipose tissue has been well documented as a tissue type that secretes a hormone known as leptin. And leptin is a hormone that slows our appetite or represses appetite. This is a way that we can maintain homeostasis in our bodies. As we become um, more overweight, we have buildup of adipose tissue in our body. The buildup of adipose causes us to have more leptin, which theoretically would lower our appetite and help us not to become as overweight. As we look at our bone tissue or osseous tissue, there's a hormone known as osteocalcin secreted by the bone builders, the osteoblast. This osteocalcin is going to be a hormone that increases the number of pancreatic beta cells and the output of insulin. If we have more insulin being output, more, more cells of the body, including the osteoblasts, are going to be able to absorb more insulin and have access to more energy. This osteocalcin is also going to inhibit weight gain and the onset of type 2 diabetes. There's another organ in the body that's present um, known as the placenta. This is an organ that is going to impact both the woman's body, the mom's body while she's pregnant, and the child's body. This is going to release both estrogen and progesterone with a wide variety of other hormones of being associated with it. The placenta serves to help regulate the pregnancy with its hormones and stimulate the development of both the fetus and the mammary glands in preparation for birth and breastfeeding. We need to spend a little bit of time focusing on diabetes, a little bit of extra special time focusing on this disease. It is becoming one of the single most expensive diseases within the United States. And as we're looking at diabetes, both types of diabetes result in blood sugar that's too high. Too much sugar means diabetes. And there's two different ways we can have too much sugar in our blood. We can have type 1 diabetes. This is an autoimmune disorder where the beta cells within the pancreas are destroyed. Those beta cells within the, insul the pancreas ultimately are going to secrete insulin. So if there's no beta cells to make the insulin, the insulin just builds up in the bloodstream. So no insulin being produced is type 1 diabetes. This is oftentimes referred to as childhood diabetes because this is when it commonly manifests itself during the uh, developmental years, prepubescent or prepuberty years. We also have type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is oftentimes referred to as the lifestyle diabetes. This is the diabetes that's associated primarily um, with the inability for our pancreas to produce enough insulin or insulin that cannot be processed. Type 2 diabetes can manifest itself in a couple different ways. If somebody is having an unhealthy lifestyle and they're increasing their body's overall volume, so they're becoming a, a very large individual, their pancreas does not become larger in response to an increase in body volume. And eventually, the pancreas just can't make enough insulin to keep concentration in that individual's body at the appropriate levels, to have a metabolically active concentration of insulin because the individual is so large that these fixed amount of insulin being produced by their pancreas can't increase to the point that it'll become metabolically active. Another thing that happens as individuals um, consume a lot of sugars, a lot of carbohydrates, is that their cells start to become accommodated. Um, they start to lose the ability to absorb glucose even when they are exposed to insulin. So when these cells are exposed to insulin, the cells cannot absorb any more glucose because to absorb more glucose would be harmful to those cells. Eventually, you can have too much of any chemical in your body. And that glucose, instead of being pulled into the cells to become toxic to the cell, instead the glucose remains in the bloodstream and eventually is urinated out, which is why many type 2 diabetics are going to have sugary urine or diabetes mellitus. So as we're looking at diabetes mellitus, type 2 diabetes, risk factors for this include um, some genetic predispositions, lifestyles, disability, or obesity, and old age. Of the people that have type 2 diabetes, 
20% do not know that they have it and of um, the overall U.S. United States population, about 9% of the United States population has diabetes. So what are the symptoms of type 2 diabetes? High blood sugar. Oh, here we go. We'll go that way. High blood sugar. And as we have lots of sugar entering into the urine, because there's lots of sugar in the blood, it's going to increase the osmolarity of the urine. That will cause more water to build up in the urine, and you need to urinate more. More frequent urination will cause increased thirst. And many of these individuals have a difficult time regulating their hunger in response to these crashing blood sugar concentrations they experience. Because if they have a difficult time storing sugar in their cells, they have a hard time of releasing the stored sugar later on in between meals. So the individuals that develop type 2 diabetes are almost always going to experience hunger or are going to experience an increased amount of hunger because of their inability to store sugar to use at a later time. Some complications associated with type 2 diabetes include kidney failure as those kidneys are working overtime. We're going to have pain in the joints um, and particularly um, the peripheral blood vessels and peripheral nerves are going to have damage. Damage to peripheral blood vessels is going to cause make it very difficult for toes and feet to heal when there's an injury. Damage to the peripheral nerves makes it so a lot of times individuals don't feel those injuries that they get on their toes and feet. Diabetic retinal Pathy is going to be the degradation or the breakdown of retina as the individual has diabetes progress. So in other words, they go blind from their diabetes or lose vision from their diabetes. To treat diabetes, the two single best things are physical activity and proper diet. However, there's also insulin injections that are available and some medications to help regulate and manage blood sugar concentrations. Let's look at the senescence or the, eight, the loss of function as our endocrine system ages. Our endocrine system has very little senescence. It generates less than any other organ system in the body. In terms of which hormones are going to show declines, our reproductive hormones, human growth hormone, and thyroid hormones decline as we age. But the other cell hormones in our body are going to be maintained at a fairly stable rate. The target cell sensitivity may decline, for the most part, those hormone concentrations remain constant. In terms of the pituitary gland, it's going to be less sensitive to those negative feedback inhibitions by glucocorticoids. What does this mean? This means that when um, somebody who's aged experiences stress, their ability to downregulate the stress response is degraded and they have prolonged stress responses. As we age, type 2 diabetes becomes much more common. Something that happens as we age is body fat built up in individuals. More body fat is going to decrease insulin sensitivity in other cells. And then our target cells, as they are exposed to tons and tons of insulin from elevated blood sugar levels, are going to have fewer insulin receptors. And consequently, we have a harder time absorbing that glucose from our bloodstream. That's all we have on this recording of the miscellaneous hormones from other tissues of the body's body and senescence of the organ systems, particularly the endocrine system. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to post them on the discussion board or shoot me an email. And as always, happy studies.